So is everybody pulled? Who needs help pulling and I'll come help pull? Uh, Mongo, uh, hold off for one second because you'll have to do like make their your tilde slash mongodb slash coupon slash logs. Yeah. That's right after you change this. Uh, when I get to the screen, do I just kind of like press enter for the ones I want or just to press delete for the ones I need? Oh, so this is you're halfway through committing. Oh. So. What do you want your commit message to be? Um, you can just put like uh, Jan 6. Yeah. It'll, okay, just commit. Because <coughs> it'll timestamp it with the date anyway. Okay. Why is it read only? Do you know what's. So always just use the dash M flag unless you've set the other thing. Oh, okay. So you have some merge, a merge conflict to fix. Anybody else having trouble with Git? Yeah, so what we're trying to do right now is we're going to get MongoDB running on each of one of your computers. Uh, but you have to give it a conf file so that it knows where to run. And so I tried to write it, but everybody needs to write their own path. Otherwise, it won't work. All right, so everybody's pulled. Do you need help? No, I'm just fixing Yeah. Is it? I installed it before, but like, I don't think it like, showed up. It's probably like the MongoDB like, host folder. Like, should it be like where yours was, like in the user? No, we're about, we're about to create that. Oh, okay. But do you have the command MongoD? So if you go to terminal and just hit Mongo D. Yeah, you're good. Uh, control Wait, C. So when you when you change the path, you just have to change the username. Yeah. So if I don't have the command, what should I do? Um, install Mongo DB. Okay. So should I just like go to the website? Yes. Yeah, so it's the Mongo DB Community Edition. Okay. I thought I was. Um, Is there a reason I just like wouldn't be able to find it, or should I just try installing it? Just try installing it again. Did did you install it with Brew, or did you install it via their? Mm -hmm. Just try one more time, and then if it doesn't work, let me know. Okay. Yes. Uh, so change user slash Jordan to your own username. All right, so after you pull, now you change the two paths to slash users, slash your own username, and then everything else can stay the same. Uh, so the system log path is where it's going to log. So MongoDB, if there's any errors, it'll log to a file. And so that's the file that we're logging to. And the second one is where is the data actually going to go? So there's a question yesterday about like when you store stuff, something on a database, where is it actually getting stored? And the answer is within whatever folder you tell it to store it. Yeah. If we don't have a Samir, like if we don't have a MongoDB folder within Yeah, we're Samir. about to do that. Oh, okay. um, and then on the bottom, it's just saying run on port 5000 and bind to my own local host IP. <coughs> Has everybody gotten up to this point? Uh, we're about to create them. So next step is to create these paths. So everybody can do CD, which will change your directory to your slash users slash username folder, do make directory mongodb, and then run that. 
I already made it, so I'm not going to actually run it. And then cd into that folder. Then you can do make directory coupon and then cd into that folder. Ah, oh, sorry. Then make directory logs and make directory data. And then make directory db. Um, I have a few others because with other projects. So we make all of these together. Yeah. Because tilde is a shortcut for whatever your home directory is. All right, so what you want to do is pull from the folder, uh, either of the repos, and then within the models folder, uh -huh. there is going to be a mongodb.conf file. Okay. And then change all the directories the paths in there to slash user slash your own username okay. and then create those paths. <laughs> so if you get stuck, just um, let me know or ask somebody near you. Um, you shouldn't have to. It'll make it automatically, yeah. It can be as long as you specify within your conf file. Any problems? Yeah. So which um, directories are we creating? Uh, so go ahead and just create all of these subdirectories. So within dbpath, you have to create slash user slash hey, they should already exist, then create mongodb, coupon, data, and db. So just not within the bootcamp folder then? Um, I did it. I did it here, okay. but wherever you want. Okay. The problem is if you do it in a Git folder, and then accidentally push that code, then your database gets pushed to Git as well. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So you just make the entire directory structure. Yeah. The log file itself will get put in automatically by Mongo, but the Directory structure up to that point needs to exist. Just make a MongoDB coupon. Uh, MongoDB coupon logs, and then MongoDB coupon data and DB. Yeah. Um, I did it in the home directory. Yeah. Just because you guys might have installed your Git folders randomly, and I thought it would be easier if everybody had it in their home folder. Yeah. After you make logs and data, what's the next? Logs, data, and then within data, you want a DB folder. Just DB. Yeah. You can move your MongoDB folder. It can be wherever you want. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there shouldn't be a Jordan user on your folder, on your computer, so go ahead and change it to your own. Yeah. For some reason, my MongoDB folder is empty. Yeah, so you just created that folder, so you have to now create the folders within that folder. Oh, I see. So. CD. CD, enter. Just CD, enter, and it'll automatically go to your home directory. Um, here, just run. One second. Uh, 
Uh huh. DB is a directory. So go ahead and just run this command: make dir dash p tilde slash mongodb slash coupon slash data slash db. And if you run that command, all of the directories will be automatically created for you. And then make dir dash p tilde slash mongodb coupon log logs. So those two commands will do that for you. <coughs> dash p means, um, yeah, so if you do man, mcdir, it says with dash p you can create all the directories in between if they're not already created. Was everybody able to do this? And then follow up question, would you rather have me would you rather me have emailed you to say set this up on your own or would you rather do it all together in class just for future reference? In class? Anybody like I would have rather had it done before I got here? Okay. All right. So next time we have to do this, I'll have you try your own conf files and then. Tiff, was that a question? I am not entirely sure if it's possibly because the files are just in a weird place. Um, I've been getting the same error even after making all the directories. Mind Googling for the the yeah. problem and then saying Windows and then I'll come take a look in a second. This is for coupon for now. Because we'll be doing coupon together and then for dorm supplies you can use the same comp file and just it'll throw it all in the same database. Yeah. So wait, I should have been wait. Look at that. This should have been it within the mo like models mm -hmm. of dorm of coupon. Yeah, it's in both of them. I put it in both of them. So if you pull, yeah. do you have a question over here? Do you have to make the Mongo Mongo D dot log, or will that get? It'll g it should be automatically created. Okay. So after I okay. after I replace these names, mm -hmm. what do I do? Do I just put those lines you said up there? Yeah, so then run the two make directory commands that are up there. Uh, yeah, so it says it already is in YAML. This is really the first time. Yeah. Can you Google and look for the default Mongo con file and then just say wh where is the default Mongo con file? Because there should be one just default on your computer somewhere and we can take a look to make sure of the spacing. Does anybody else have troubles getting up to this point? All right, so after you've done that, go ahead and run the command to start MongoDB. 
which is mongod dash f, and then the mongo cont file, wherever it is. No, we're, yeah, you just have to point the the um, script to wherever the config file is. So Mongo D. So if you don't see anything, then it's a good thing. So we're just looking for. Oh, you got a command not found? So that means you didn't uh, successfully install MongoDB. So go ahead and try to reinstall it. Uh, Is nothing supposed to be happening? If you have if a blank line, just like I do, then that means it's running and you're all good. Ooh. I think I might have. So I have it installed on my, like, I had it installed for Windows, and then it mm -hmm. asked me to reinstall it for oh. Bash. So. You do have it installed. Yeah, because I reinstalled it. So is it possible that it's like the fact that I installed it twice? I don't think so. Because it's just a script that'll run. installed. Uh, where's your um, the git directory? So do, can you try Googling for the actual error? And then come sit up here, and I'll help you as uh, the rest of the class. Uh, yes, the community edition. Yep, so do you have Homebrew installed by any chance? All right, then go ahead and um, So either run through these actually. So after this finishes installing, just run that brew install MongoDB, and then it'll install it for you. Uh, it should already. Hmm. Go ahead and yeah, just create it. Just do touch mongo.log uh, if you're in the right directory. So cd into there. Uh, did you already create the entire directory? Yeah. Okay, so just touch the log file, and it should. Anybody else having any troubles? Um, 
here real quick. Um, I'm going to start right here. Because I think there's a problem with the... Okay. So Tiff is having the same problem. Um, you know what ha Well, actually, uh, what just happened, I'll explain. I tried running MongoDB. Okay. Mm -hmm. I definitely installed it. Okay, so you got a bunch of stuff and then it aired at the end. But it, it said I had to reinstall it, actually. It, it did? It just said it wasn't installed, so I just reinstalled it using okay. the sudo command it gave me, app mm -hmm. get okay, Mongo yeah. or whatever, and now I'm getting this error. So I wonder if I can install like a different version or something like that. I think that's nice. fine. It's just not reading the cont file correctly, and I don't know why. Um, so you and Tiff are actually having the exact same problem. So do you want to both just move to the front row, and I'll help you as I get the rest of the class going? Um, Apparently, I, I thought I had MongoDB installed, so I'm doing that now. Mm -hmm. I thought I had this, which <laughs> apparently is not working for, like, the command doesn't work. OK. Hmm. Are you just installing Homebrew right now? Yeah, then okay, so, so then you just, yeah, do brew install MongoDB, and then it'll install it for you. Okay. So do you want to move down next to him because you guys are at the same stage and then... Okay, I just wonder what this password is. Oh, so it's actually typing, it's just not showing the password. So just go ahead and type it and hit enter. Oh, okay. So dorm supplies and coupons will have the same file, right? For now, yeah. But do we have to change the path? You can, just, you can just run the same Mongo. So Mongo just gets an instance running and then you can use the same instance for dorm supplies. So you just throw everything in the same database and it'll work. But don't worry about that for now. We'll, I'll talk about it before, as soon as I get everybody else going. So, so this is a later problem? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, this, it created these two files. No, I'm making it yep. a later problem. Oh, it's a yeah. okay. Where is the MongoDB like, uh, code running, like their database code? Because I downloaded it at some point, and then it, it created, I think it created mm -hmm. this MongoDB file, but before I put the coupons. And yeah. Was this really all the... Um, no, it's actually in a different folder. But don't worry about that for now. If, are you working? Does yours, uh, does yours function? Okay, so go ahead and run that. So this means you didn't successfully install it. So do you have Homebrew installed by any chance? So do so install Homebrew. It's one command, and then do brew install MongoDB, and it'll. So in, look up the instructions to install Homebrew. Oh, okay, you're also a Windows person. So if you go um, sit next to Tiff over there, because they have the exact same problem and they're troubleshooting, and I'll troubleshoot all three of you. Other Did you get it? Oh. Uh, okay. Do you have the same exact data? Uh, main log files. Yeah, that should be okay. Uh, did you run the MongoD? <laughs> yes. I ran MongoD from the. So I'm just trying to make it. I think it works. So, as, as so make sure you use this config file, though. Oh, yeah. I, okay. <coughs> oh. Okay. So do you want to sit over there with the other Windows people? Because I think everybody's having the same error. <laughs> Let me, let me try. Okay, and if you, but if you get it working, will you go over and show them how you got it working? All right. Wait, um, are they using Steam or PowerShell? They're using Bash on. Okay, I have Windows 7, so I can do PowerShell. I don't oh, okay. If you get it working, then that's awesome. <laughs> so it's still saying. Oh, wait, I think I. No, no. Yeah, I don't know. It's still saying I can't open this. Uh, your username's Haley James. Okay. Do most people have it running uh, within the cont file? <laughs> um, the cont file and both repos are the same. Either one. All you want is the cont file for now. Okay. If I like clone this one, and I also clone 
or yes. Dorm supplies? Yeah, so Dorm Supplies is different. This one will have right. the coupon code. Okay. But each one has a MongoD conf in it. Okay. All right, so who is good? Who has it running? Majority? Who has problems still? A few people. Um, so the people who are having problems, just hold off for now, and I'll come help you at break. Um, but I'm going to start writing code, and you can follow along and write the code. And we just won't run the code, so it's fine. So if you're still having troubles, just abort now, and then I'll come help during break. But we'll go ahead and move on and start writing code in the controllers. So if you have it working, go ahead and just keep it running in a shell somewhere. Because if you, if you stop it running, then the MongoD will just kind of shut down. So you have to keep it running as you go. So yesterday, we started working in a controller file for um, our users. Does everybody still have this file? So this should be in coupon API. So coupon is the one that we'll be doing in class, and dorm supplies is the one you guys will be doing during breaks or during hack times. But does everybody still have this code? Um, it was pushed a while back, and it's what we wrote in lecture yesterday. Is that the one in the controllers folder? In controllers. It's in boot camp slash coupon API slash controllers um, and then user.js. So it's the controllers file that we were working on yesterday. Does everybody, does everybody have this file? Who, does anybody not have this file? If so, just pull from Git and it's there. All right, so we were, yesterday we were writing controllers in order to get users and add to users and stuff. And so now we're going to start interfacing with our database. And so how are we going to do that? So where do you think we're going to have to start adding files or adding libraries. Have we told our database that, or our main server file that we're connecting to a database? Not yet, right? So we're probably going to have to do that first. So if we open up our database file, which is at couponapi.js, We'll have to add a few things in order to get our database working. So does anybody remember what library we're using in order to interface with MongoDB? Mongoose. Mongoose. So we'll have to use Mongoose up here as well. <coughs> huh? Oh, yeah. So what did I just do by writing const mongoose gets require mongoose? Who remembers? What, does, what did I just do? Yeah, I just said, all right, import mongoose into our file. So if I run this code, will it work?
Yeah, I need to make sure that we actually have that library installed, right? So how do we install a new library? NPM. So if we include a new library, how are we then going to install it? Yeah, npm install. So npm install dash s save will automatically add it to our package.json and then the name of the file. And then there we go. Was everybody able to do that? npm install dash dash save mongoose. It doesn't matter. As long as you're in a, in a child directory of the project you're working on, it'll add it to the package.json and put it into the, node mod, the correct node modules. It cannot be above it. Otherwise, it'll install it in that folder. It'll start looking up until it finds one. Everybody able to do that? So now that we imported Mongoose, we could check the docs and say, how do we connect to the Mongoose? How do we tell Mongoose to connect? But I already did that. And I'll go ahead and just give you the command. It's mongoose.connect. And then you have to give it some sort of URL. And so we can do localhost colon 5000. So why is localhost colon 5000 going to work? Did anybody read the conf file that I sent you? Yeah, what was at the bottom? It said bind to localhost 5000. And so the database instance that we have running on our computer is running at localhost 5000. And so that is where we're going to point Mongoose to connect to. And now we're good. So we, in, we imported Mongoose and then told Mongoose to connect to the database that's running at localhost 5000. And if your database is running off in the cloud somewhere, you just point it to there. Make sense? Everybody good? So now we are successfully connected to a database. And now we can start working on our controllers. Everybody with me? And so let's just make sure that everything's good in our schemas folder. And so yesterday, we wrote a schema. And at the top, we already did const mongoose gets require mongoose. So we already assumed yesterday that we had already installed mongoose, but we're just doing that now. So everything should be good in this file. And so how do we tell our user's controller file that we want to import our user's database or our user's schema that we created in our models? slash schema directory. Anyone know?
Because if, if you remember from our user schema, what's the very bottom line? What's the very bottom line? What does this say? Yeah, so we're, we're exporting the user that we created. The line above that says var user is mongoose.model user and that user schema that we had written up above. And so the whole point of the user schema directory is that we created our baseline, what, what does our user look like? And then we went and created what you could think of as just a database of users. And then we went and included it into our controller's file so that we can start using that database. Does that make sense? Is anybody completely lost? Yeah, so yesterday we were working on our schema over here on the left. And we did var user schema gets a new schema and defined what types and, um, and properties that we were expecting. <coughs> And then we went and created a few hooks, some pre-save hooks, and then exported it as a user. And so what that does is it creates our schema, and then this line here creates our mongoose model, which you can think of as just like the database full of users. And then we went and exported that object so that we could include it into other files. And so over here on the right where we say const user gets require that user file, that means take that user database type thing that we created in the schema and include it over here so that we can start to use it. Does that make sense? Yeah? Is the user with a capital U, um, where is that referenced? Or like, are we using it in the next file? Or how does it... Yeah, so on the left or on the right? Um, on the left, line 81. Yeah, so line 80, 81. So line 79, we declare this variable called capital user which we're saying is mongoose.model, so create a model or a database based on the user schema that we defined above. Because user schema is defined right here, line four, and then all the following lines is what we're adding to that user schema. So you see user schema.virtual, user schema.methods, and then we create a mongoose model, or you can think of it as a pseudo database out of that user schema, call it capital users, and export it. We could have called it whatever we want. We could have called it like this is, is our database. And then exported that. And it would function exactly the same. Okay. And then over here, we're saying. Remember that thing that we exported from the schema? Go ahead and import it into this file. Does that make sense? So, yeah, so we're importing it on the right file. Okay. What we exported on the left, we're importing onto the right. And the syntax for importing it? Is required. Is, is the line number one? Or? Line number one. Everybody with me? So now we have a real database in this file. So yesterday we were using our var user database get to empty array. So we no longer have to use this empty array. But I'll keep it in there so we can reference it and compare and contrast to what we're actually doing. And so yesterday we also had this insert user function that we wrote, which added a user to our array. And so in Mongoose, there's also a way to insert a user. And so let's go ahead and write create user using our Mongoose command rather than our um, one that we wrote yesterday. So yesterday we said var new user gets this object. And today we're going to actually create a real user out of it. Um, so we can go ahead and do that by saying, rather than just creating an object, an object literal, we can say create a new user with that object as its parameter.
Does that make sense? We can make it a little bit cleaner if we did this. Just so it's more obvious that what we're doing, we're creating the data by pulling out the stuff from rec.body and then creating a new user based on that, based on that object. And then what did we do in line 37 yesterday? Anyone? Can anybody remember what that code did? Yeah, we called our insert user command, which added the user to the database. And so the way we do that in Mongoose is we can just do new user dot save. And so what that does is it says, hey, Mongoose, just insert this user into our database. It takes an optional callback function. Uh, do you remember what we did yesterday with our callback function? What does it do? Yeah, it sends a response. Otherwise, the requester will just be left hanging. So we can also pass it a callback function. Which actually takes two parameters. And just ignore the parameters and say res... So let's compare and contrast what we did yesterday and today. So yesterday we did var data gets this, and then we did user db dot insert that object, and then as a callback, we returned it worked. Is there any difference between what we did yesterday and what we did today? Yeah. Yeah, today it actually works. It's actually asynchronous, but logically, is there any difference? Not really, right? We'd already written pretty much the same code yesterday. And now, rather than using our fake database that we created from an array, we're using a real database. And so logically, it's exactly the same. And we can actually just strip out all this stuff that we wrote yesterday. Well, just the insert part. Yeah? Um, I read the documentation. So the question was, how do I know that we create a new user by saying new user and then passing it data? And the answer is, if you read the documentation, it'll take you through these steps. Um, and so I read the documentation for you guys and I'm telling you the highlights, I guess. Yeah? So dot save is based on that function we created. So dot, dot save is actually a method on the user from Mongoose. Oh, not the thing no, so yesterday the thing that we created up here, the dot insert user, is our analogous method. So it's something that we created. Huh? Yeah, I was thinking of like the save hook. Is that different? Ah, so the save hook. So, so when we do new user dot save, if you reference the schema that we wrote yesterday, we have a, a pre save hook which means if somebody invokes the save method on this schema, then before you actually save, run this hook just to make sure everything's going well. Yeah, good question. Yeah? Um, this is in the schema file. Does it have to be the same name as the file user? Because they're both, like, for example, it's both user dot, users dot JS, right? Or mm -hmm. it's user and then user. So it doesn't, you just do that for organization's sake? Or? Yeah, so the question is, does the file name users.js and user.js need to match? And the answer is no, because if we look at the bottom here, this, whatever the file name doesn't matter. It's just where the file storing on, is stored on your computer. All that matters is what we export at the bottom. And so we do module.exports gets whatever we created. User, capital user, is just the variable name that I defined here. But I could have called that whatever I want. 
And then on the right over here, we say const user is require this file. And so whatever we had called that file on the left, we have to tell the computer like, hey, read that file in particular. Yeah. But it doesn't matter what the name actually is. And so we're just storing whatever that file exported as const user. We can call that variable whatever we want as well, but for organization's sake, we're calling it user. Nope. So if we change the name here to asdif and here as well, all that means is whatever we export from this file is whatever we declared asdif to be, which is this model. Oh. That does not affect anything on the stuff on the right. So like on line one, it says const user with a capital U. Mm -hmm. So line 79 means take Yeah, so Yeah, exactly. So what we did up above is we defined a schema. So what should one user look like? And what should happen when you try to save this one user? And now we're saying this one user create a table or a database or a collection of these users, a model per se, based off of this one schema, this one user prototype that we had created. And so what that does is it creates that mongoose. You can think of it as just a, a database or a collection of those schemas. And then we go ahead and export that and import it into any of the files that we're going to use. Does that make sense? <coughs> So does everybody understand the code that we wrote for create user? Does anybody not understand? All right. So now let's do module.getUserById. And so yesterday we had a getUserById function that was part of our array. And what we did is we iterated through the array looking for that ID. And so now let's write the analogous one in Mongoose. So I'll save that one so we can reference it. And so now we just say, we tell it what, are we, what prototype or what database are we going to look in. And we'll, it's in users or user. And then conveniently, there's a method on that called find by ID, which takes an ID. And so what are we going to pass it? Rec.params.id. Yeah, exactly. And so if we just ended that statement here, what would happen? It, would just, it wouldn't really do anything, right? We're telling, hey, database, find this user. And then we're not really telling the database what to do with the user. So he says, OK, I found it, but our server just ignores him. And so we should tell him what to do after we find the user. And so what are we going to possibly do? give it a callback, right? Which is another function which takes two arguments, an error and the user. <coughs> and then what do we want to do? <coughs> yeah, return res.json, the user. So, and so the question is, do we care about the error? My answer is yes, but for now I'm just showing you the concept, like how do we, act, how do, we do with it assuming that it finds a user? But now let's handle the cases where there isn't actually a user. So what happens when there isn't a user? It returns an empty user object. And so we can say if the user doesn't exist, then return res.status 404 we can just say hey we didn't find it sorry
And so 404 means what in HTTP status codes? Not found. So we could send whatever we want. We could send a 500 here if we wanted to. We could send 5,000 if we wanted to. Um, but that wouldn't re really mean anything. And we should send status codes that actually have a meaning behind them. But we could send whatever we want. Yeah, is that a question? Um, find by ID is Mongoose. It creates that for you. Mm -hmm. So capital user is a Mongoose object. It's like their database. You can think of it as just the user database. So if we're using a um, relational database, we'd have to do select star from users where ID equals rec.params.id. But for this document base, since we're using an ODM, which is the what from yesterday? Yeah, object document uh, mapping, it allows you to just map these things to a document. So it's just saying, here's an easier way to query for you. Um, here? Yeah. So, so the question is, in the callback, what is that user parameter? And so if we look back to the function that we wrote yesterday, our get user by ID, <coughs> we said, hey, this is a function that takes an ID and a callback. And what we're going to do is we're going to find that user for you and then pass to your callback the user that we found. And so when we call that function at the bottom, we, we pass it a uh, ID and a function that expects a user because as we know from the function that we wrote that callback is going to get invoked and get past a user and so if you read through the mongoose documentation it says hey our function called find by ID I'm not going to show you my code you probably don't care about my code but all you care about is it expects a callback that will have an error if there's an error and will pass the user as well Yeah, so find by ID expects an ID just like our get user by ID function and expects a callback. And the callback takes two parameters, one of them being the user just like in ours and one being an error. And it'll pass the error if it's found or if it occurs. Does that make sense? So what do we want to do if there actually is an error? So we should probably add a check. If there is an error, what do we want to do? We could just say, hey, there's an error. And that would be perfectly fine. Meaning if there was an error that happened while Mongoose was looking for our user, then just say, hey, 500, which means what? Server error, internal server error. And just say, oops. The more correct way to do it in Express would be to pass it to our error handler. And so if you remember in our server file at the very bottom, there are a couple error handlers. And the way to invoke those is to pass an error. So we could call next error. Does this line of code confuse anybody? So if you remember back to the lecture on middleware, every middleware has access to the request object, the response object, and the next chain, the next middleware in the sequence. And so earlier we were saying uh, each middleware that we define will use the, the rec and res, but we don't really care about the next object because we know we're just going to return no matter what. But for this one, we're going to error handle the way the industry standard and so we actually want to keep track of that third argument, next, whatever the next middleware in the chain is. And so if there's an error, we can pass that error to the next middleware. 
And so if you remember, we defined a couple error handler middlewares at the bottom of our, of our file. And so we're just saying pass this error to our error handlers, and they'll handle it however we tell them. And does anybody remember what we did? It was pretty much the same thing as res.send500. Do you want to reference that code? Yeah. So we're looking now at the top left. So we have our development and production error handlers. And both of them just do app.use, function, air, rec res next, res.status, 500.send. But if we define a status in our error, then it'll send that error code instead. And so what's the difference between passing it to our, oops, this has to be return. So what was the, what bug did I just fix? So before it was if error, call next error, but then I want to change it to return next error. Why? What possible bug would have been there if this were the code? Yeah, it would continue, exactly. So it, it would say if there's an error, call next error, and then keep running code. And maybe, maybe there was no user and it sent 404 rather than a 500. But there was, there was a little race condition there because next error was getting called and we're trying to run this. And so we don't know which one would actually get invoked. So to fix that, we do return next error. Does that make sense? Anybody confused? Yeah, so middle handler, uh, middleware error handlers up here is they handle errors. They do exactly what their name suggests, and so they will accept an error. So the way to define an error handler is just any middleware that takes four arguments rather than three, where the first one is the error. And you get to do with it whatever you want. So in development, we're going to console.log our error and then return some sort of status. But in production, we're not going to console log. We're just going to return some status. But we can do whatever we want. We could say res.status, res.send, sorry, there was an error. And so what did I just change? What now happens if there's an error? Yeah, so now every time there's an error, we call res.send, sorry there was an error, which actually returns a 200 status code and just tells them there's an error. Yeah? Isn't there a set header method for your doing res.send twice? Um, so the question is, since we're doing res.send twice, are we going to get an error? Um, the answer is no, because we're returning on the first one. So we, when we do re return res.send, it will never execute the second code. Mm -hmm. um, it goes to the next, uh, middleware, next Yeah, so next error invokes whatever the next middleware in the chain is, but since we're passing an error, it'll skip straight to our error handlers. So we put multiple error handlers in middleware? Uh, yes. And we could have had another error handler. We could say... So how are we, let's do this. Let's create a new error handler that just says console.log, hey, there's an error, and then invokes our real error handler. So how would we do that? So how do we create an error handler? Yeah. So if I did this, what would happen? So is this an error handler? I see shaking heads, why not? Yeah, so what would this actually do? Yeah, so this act, what this actually does is it's normal with middleware, and our request object is called error, 
our re response object is called rec, and our next um, callback is called res. So this is just normal ones, and it will just change the name of rec, res, and next. And so we need to actually give it a next. And so what do we want it to do? Console log, oops. And then how do we say now pass to the next error handler? Next. And then we have to pass the actual error. Does that make sense? Um, the development error handler if dev is true, oh, okay. or the production error handler if not. So the next, like, line. Yep, it just goes straight down, straight down the chain, because express is just a chain of these middleware functions, and one will pass to the next, and pass to the next, and pass to the next, until one returns. Um, they do whatever you want. So this one will just console log oops and then call the next error handler, which depending if the development flag is set, it will either console log the full error and then return just a status or just only return the status. Okay, so like the purpose of these error handlers is to kind of detect certain situations and um, console log the correct message? Um, so half of that was true. The purpose of an error handler is to run when an error occurs. That's absolutely true. But it's not necessarily true that they will console log. It's only true because we told them to console log. Um, so these, two, these things will run when an error occurs. But, and they'll just do whatever we tell them to do. Um, correct. And so the question is, within the development error handler, I'm not in calling next like this. Uh, why not? Because it already returned a result or a response. Any questions? We can delete this if it's confusing people and just have only one error handler. All right, so does everybody understand how get user by ID works? Is there any, anything unclear about that? Do you see how it's almost exactly the same as the function we wrote yesterday? Is it more robust or less robust? More? What? Yeah, so yesterday we just said return res.json user. What happens if the user wasn't found? That's a big bug, right? So yesterday we said user db dot user by id, we pass it an id, and in the callback we return that user. But if we look at our function, what happens if the user isn't found? This code runs and then nothing. So the, if the user doesn't exist, the requester is just, sit, just hanging forever. So that was a bug, and so we fixed that over here by saying if there isn't actually a user, then send user not found. So it's, it is more robust. So let's go ahead and delete the old code from yesterday. All right, now let's go ahead and do get users. So yesterday we just sent the whole user DB. Could we do this today? Would this work? I see people saying no. Why, why or why not? What is capital user right now? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's more of like our whole database. It's not just an array of the users like it was yesterday, but it's actually just, it's this huge object that has a ton of things on it. We can actually, is, is anybody curious what the user thing looks like? We can, um, so let's run the node REPL. Can you guys see? Let's do var user gets require users. Uh, this is, let's actually, So now user is whatever we ex export from our user schema. It's actually this massive object, which has some hooks, whatever, base, model, schema. Let's try to find the find by functions that we had. So we have find one and update. And the finds are probably in the prototype. Is this image display data or like documents that you just throw them in there? If we like would they show up in this like serialization? Uh no. no. They would you have to submit a query, which is one of these. But this is what would be returned to the user if we had sent res.json this. And so that's probably not what we want to send, right? So what do we want to do conceptually? What would be our algorithm? Yeah, I hear user.find something. So we want to just find everything, right? So let's go ahead and delete this. And we'll do something like user.find something. Uh, the way to search for everything is search for an empty object. So whatever matches empty object, everything will match empty object, and then callback. So user query by empty means give me everything back. And then function air.users. So why did I have the function take users as a second parameter? Down below, I have the callback being function that takes error and user. Yeah? All the users that get found, they're matching. Yeah. So I've read the documentation. I see that user.find in its callback expects two parameters, an error and all of the users. And so I'm just calling it users. I could have called it user if I wanted to, but just to not confuse whoever is reading my code, I called it users because it's an array of users. And I only know this because I read the documentation. And so now, what do we want to do? What's the first parameter? Like uh, the first parameter is an error. So if, if an error occurred. Of the, of the of oh, so user.find. Uh, the first parameter is an object that you're matching on. So if we wanted to re change this to use user.find, it would be user.find where the ID matches rec.params.id. Oh, so that's, that's yeah, so it's just whatever you want to match on. So like using an empty object is like wild card. Yeah, it just means match everything. Okay. And so this is exactly the same as what we did earlier. But uh, there's actually a page in the documentation that says they're exactly the same, but it also says if you're doing this, always use find by ID. So I'm going to blindly trust the documentation. But now presumably we have all of our users in an array called users. I know it's an array because I read the documentation. And so what are we going to do? Yeah, return res.send 
users. And I'm going to start preferring to use the res.json rather than res.send, so we send it in JSON format. <coughs> So the question is, where does users come in? And so in our user.find function, it takes two parameters, a query, like a query object, and a callback, where the callback has two parameters itself. One is an error if an error is found, and the second is an array of any users that matches the query. And so the only way you would know this was if you read the documentations or had somebody tell you who had read the documentation. Mm -hmm. Yep. So capital user is just that user database. You can think of it as that way. So this is, if you were using SQL, this would be select star from user where 1 equals 1. So everything is true, and so it'll pass everything. Or just select star from users. Yeah, you can call it. You can call them whatever you want. Yeah. So, so as we define any function, we can define their parameters as whatever we want them to be called. So this could be. Uh oh. And this could be, and. And this is totally fine if we change this to an array of users. And so we're just naming that error and users because it's short and it's explanatory. Yeah? How do you know which one is the right So if you read the documentation, it says the callback, the first thing that's passed back will be an error if an error occurs. Second is the array of users. So if we wanted to actually change um, this, our old get user by ID, to function the same way, we would say um, callback null this. And so it would always pass back null as the error. And then if an error occurs, I don't know how we would cause an error to occur, but um, try this. So that would restructure our code to perform just like the um, mongoose one. So what it does, so what try catch does, it tries to do something, and if an error occurs, rather than throwing the error, it passes the error to the catch function. And so if we try this and an error occurs, then invoke the callback with the first argument being error. We don't have to pass it a second argument because um, it'll just be undefined. And if it works, pass the callback null as the error. So there was no error, and this as the second parameter. And so now this, our get user by ID function, or our method, performs exactly like the uh, find by ID method in Mongoose. Does that answer your question? So between lines 6 and 23, we're kind of starting to recode our own version of Mongoose. Um, albeit a much worse one, but it's starting to perform in kind of the same way. Any questions in get users? So what do we, what are we missing? Um, nothing. That was just left over from our code from yesterday. <coughs> So what are we forgetting to do and get users? Yeah, we should do some error handling. So if uh-oh happens, we should return next uh-oh. Do we want to send 404 if there are no users? Yep. 
Yeah, so what, what happens if there are no users? Do we want if an array of users dot length is zero? Do we want to do anything special? Anyone say yes? Anyone say no? Nobody voted. <laughs> All right, everybody has to vote. If you want it to return something special, raise your hand. If you want it to not do anything special, raise your hand. So that's a design choice. You can do whatever you want. Um, generally, what would happen would be you don't do anything special because when you're writing your API documentation for other people to use your API, it should always return some sort of array. And so what would happen if there was no length? We would probably just return res.json empty array, which is essentially the same thing as if we had returned an array of users where array of users was already an empty array. And so I kind of made an argument without giving reason that we would want, we would want to return an array in all cases. Why might I say that? So think back to C forever ago when you would declare a function and you do void main or int main, whatever, whatever. And then to create a new function, you would give it like int this that takes whatever does something. And so what does that int do? Yeah, yeah it's telling you what type the function's eventually going to return. And so in C, it's strictly required that your function always returns the same type. In JavaScript, it's loosely typed, and so we can return whatever the heck we want. We can return a string in some cases, we can return an array in other cases, but it's generally good practice, especially in an API, to always return the same type. That way, people who use the API, the next, they might call get users, and then immediately throw the return into an iteration, like for whatever, do this, like print out that user. And so if we return a string in some cases, an array in other cases, an object in other cases, a number in some cases, then a lot of code would break. And they can no longer assume what is going to pass back. And so especially in an API, you want to return the same type in all cases. And so if there are no, array in, if there are no users in our database, it would make sense to send an empty array. Because that's saying it's an array of all of the users that we found. In this case, nothing. So this code is perfectly fine, but it's the exact same function as if we had just done that. So everybody was right. Does that make sense? All right, so we have create user. <coughs> we have get users. What are we missing in our CRUD model? Update and delete. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and delete our old database. Does anybody want me to keep it around? No, okay. Um, and so now we have create user, get users, get user by ID. And now let's do, who wants to do post and who wants to do, which one do you, would you rather do first, put or delete? All right, let's do delete first because it's probably going to be easier. Uh, module dot exports. So why again am I doing module dot exports dot delete user by ID? So why do I prepend user module dot exports? Why can't I just do this? Yeah, exactly. We have to export it so that our server file can import it. And so if we just start declaring functions, they won't get exported. And so we need to do module.exports. Do the user by ID. What will we do is this is right now just an object, mm -hmm. like an empty object containing a header of these functions. Like, do we need to pick these up somehow to like the model and a subsequent file? Just like how, how do we end up? Yep. So let's just see what happens. So let's set that to empty object. Save the file. And so I just save the file, and I'm going to run this 
in the node REPL. And if you look, what we exported was all of our functions. So we had a create user function, a get users function, a get user by ID function, and delete user by ID is just an empty object because over here I just said create an empty object. But if I had done this, um, If I'd done that instead, then it doesn't actually get exported. And why not? So why does this function delete user not get exported? Yeah, because it's not part of the module.exports object. Yeah, so that, that was the first part of the answer. And so how are we going to start using that in our other functions, our other files? So if you remember, um, let me just close this. This is our coupon API, our main server file. At the top, we have const users is require dot slash controller slash users. So what does that do? The exact same thing that we did here, right? Yeah, we're importing the controller users file the user's controller file. So same thing as I did on the REPL. And so later on, in our routes, we did app.get slash users. So if somebody tries to get users, what function do we run? Users.get users, which then invokes this function over here. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. All right, and so now let's do module. And so do I have to call this delete user by ID? No, I can call it whatever I want, but I'm using that just because it's easy to remember. And so how might we delete a user? Yeah, so we'll have to look up the documentation. Uh, somebody just Googled it, and it's which? Yeah, find one and remove, which is a method on that user object. So we could use that. Find one and remove. So if you look up the documentation, or if you Google mongoose delete from whatever, it'll pop up. And we do user.find one and remove, and what does it take as parameters? Yeah, so we can pass an ID and a callback. And what does a callback return expect? Do you have the documentation open? Uh, it returns the, the test without document. Mm -hmm. So it returns an error, maybe, in the uh, document that was found, and then it invokes that callback. And so what do we want to do? <coughs> Whatever we want. Um, so let's do some error checking first this time. So what's my next line? This is a line that you're going to write a lot. So it's basic error checking. If find when remove returned an error with it, then we should pass that to our error handler. What else should we check for? Yeah, if we didn't get a user back, then what should we do? Yeah, probably return to 404. Four. 
And what's the l last case, the only other case? Yeah, if we get a user, it means they found a user and they deleted the user. So what should we do? Res.json user. So we're returning the user that was deleted. Yeah. Does that sound weird to you? No. It sounds a little weird to me too. Like, right? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a good point. So if you pop something off of a stack, then it returns that to you and removes it from the stack. But the other argument is, why did you return it to me? I told you to delete it. And so this is another design choice we get to make. Um, who thinks we should return the user back? Who thinks we should not? Looks like there's slightly more people who say not. I would also vote for not. And so if we didn't want to return the user back, what would we do? Yeah, res.status. What status do we want to send? 200.send. We could send OK. Or we could use the shortcut, which is um, res.send status 200. We don't have to unless we use next. Um, this one we didn't have any error handling. Oh, yeah, actually we did. Good call. Yes. All right, so we're making some good progress. What are we missing now? Update. Oh, everybody's favorite, huh? So in our other API that we had, when we did update user or update whatever, what did we have to do? We always said it was a pain in the butt, right? So what made it such a pain? Anyone? So what made updating a user annoying? Is that a hand? Well, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so when you update the user, you only send the information you want to change. And so that creates a lot of different cases. So we'll have to check, oh, did they change this? Did they change this? Did they change this? And so that's what made updating a user really annoying. But in Mongoose, they take care of that all for you. And actually use their update method, which is user dot find one and update. And so we have to give it an ID to find one. So what ID are we going to pass? Rec.prams.id. Then we pass it a new object of anything that wants to be updated. <coughs> and so what object are we going to pass there? Rec.body. Yeah, exactly, rec.body. An object that contains all of the form or all of the JSON that was sent to us in the request. And so that will have any of the um, fields that, would, that they want to update. And so that's pretty much it. We also, of course, want to pass a callback, which will take an error and the user, just like usual. Um, and so what would we want to do in our callback? Yeah, error check. Mm. 
what else? Another error check. So the question is, what happens if there's something in ref.body that we don't expect? Like a new field that we didn't expect in our schema? And the answer to that is, since we just find a schema, Mongoose will ignore everything that's not in that schema. And so it takes care of all of that validation for us. And so what do we want to do now? <coughs> So same, same thing as delete, right? Do we want to say, OK, it was updated, or do we want to return the new user? Return the new user. So I believe I've, let me check the documentation, but I believe with find one update, it actually returns the user before it updates. So let me double check the, oh, we can already see. Uh-oh, find one update doesn't return updated user. Let's actually read the real documentation and not go straight to Stack Overflow. Um, so here's, here's that call that we made. It issues a MongoDB find and modify update command. It takes a query a doc, which is the new updated doc, any options that we want, and then a callback function. And so let's read through the available options. New bool, if true, return the modified document rather than the original, defaults to false. Is that what we want to use? Yeah. So if we set new to true, then it'll return the modified document rather than the original one. And it does default to false. So we should do new true as the third argument. And now we'll do what we expect. Any questions up until this point? So we finished crud for users. Is there anything that we're missing at all? We probably want to do some validation of input and create user eventually, but the schema takes care of a lot of that for us. The nice thing if we do it in our endpoint is that we can construct whatever um, error message we send back. So if they don't give us a email or something that's required, we could say, return res.status 400, you're missing an email. And so I always recommend that you do validation in the endpoint as well as the schema for that reason. Any questions up until this point? Do you feel comfortable writing the CRUD endpoints for your users in the, in the dorm supplies app? All right, so I, uh, did everybody read my email from yesterday? Do you all know who your partners are? So go ahead and find your partner and start working on your CRUD for the users. And I'll come help people who are having trouble with Git and or MongoDB. <laughs>